je crois à la venue des petits pays. Et je crois que les orages économiques seront plus dévastateurs dans les grands pays. Parce que les petits pays auront des ressources indigènes que les grands pays n'auront pas. Les énormes pour un pouvoir ne sont pas aujourd'hui certains de continuer à dominer le monde. Les empires s'effondrent et les empires ne sont pas éternels. Et, et, mais les petites entités euh, qui peuvent subsister par elles-mêmes sur la propre force de, de, de leurs de leur, de leur ressources euh, autochtones, on peut être plus d'avenir dans la complexité du monde que, que, que les grandes idées. L'idée de... Nous vivons encore sur l'idée du pouvoir et de la puissance. Mais peut-être que c'est déjà dépassé. Sans que nous nous rendions compte, peut-être que c'est déjà dépassé et que la puissance ne, 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 serve, ne, ne, ne suffise plus à, 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 à régler les problèmes. J'ai peur beaucoup, les petits petits, j'ai l'air beaucoup. La complexité dans mon parvion, euh, elle, elle passe dans les petits pays avant de retentir dans les grands. Euh, et c'est la vérité. Et elle passe dans ce que j'appelle les archipels avant de retentir sur les continents. Euh, auparavant, c'est les continents qui dominaient le monde. On disait, il y a cinq continents, il y a quatre races. Mais nous savons aujourd'hui que ce n'est pas vrai. Il n'y a pas que cinq continents, il y a les archipels, il y a toutes les mers du monde qui sont des sources de vie. Euh, et, et, et il n'y a pas que quatre races. Il y a des centaines de races. De ça, euh, donc la multiplicité vient de, de ces endroits un peu secrets, un peu méconnus, euh, qui, qui, qui bouleversent en eux-mêmes euh, ce qui se fait dans le monde, le passage du monde, et qui ont attendu sans qu'on en qu ait conscience euh, sur... Euh, sur les grandes aires, les grandes surfaces continentales de puissance et, 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 et de pouvoir. traditionnelle française, ouais, c'était un peu ça. Donc c'était associer, associer le savoir, disons, aux réalités antillaises, c'est-à-dire ne plus parler de, parler aussi, mais de, ne plus parler de vendange ou de blé, etc., mais parler aussi de canne à sucre, ne pas parler uniquement de climat tempéré, automne, hiver, printemps, etc., mais parler aussi de, de climat tropical, en fait, tout ça en, en amenant une réflexion. Tu entends
was the, the, the film make Glissam's difference with Fanoi Senghor and Cesar Lurki here? Or mm. you, could, you could see him, what, you could understand what he's trying to do. Because he's, he's basically, yes, I mean, we can explain him in a kind of a, a didactic manner, one, two, three, four. That is, he first deal, dealt with the, the diaspora, the Atlantic crossing, and what does the diaspora mean to uh, people of African descent? Uh, so, and how do they create their relation to Africa after slavery? So, we can do it didactically like that. After that, we look at uh, what, it, what it is to live in the new world for black people what he called the Le Jardin Creole, Creole Garden, and how they recompose their own lives with the traces of other cultures, both black, white, Indian, the climate, the geography, everything. I, so, I didn't understand how that related, though, to that one sentence that he said when he was like getting over what was forgotten. Yeah. I didn't understand that. Well, it seems like in, a contradiction. Okay, maybe you can tell me what he's trying to say. You know, the before Gleason, the predominant tendency is to deal with memory. You know, because you know, blacks are forced out of Africa through slavery. So, what do we make of memory? And what do you do with that memory? And how do you go back to trace it and relate to Africa, to trace your roots and so on? whether it's through DNA or through the film's roots, all of that. I, it seemed like most of the film was about that, you know, and was like pro-dealing pro with traces, pro-dealing with authenticity and... and no, and he's pro-dealing with... He can, he can deal with traces and deal with authenticity. He can deal for both. Right, he seemed like in favor... But he, then that of one, traces. He's in favor of traces. But that one sentence that he said, maybe I read it wrong... I'm no, you read it right. When he said, we need to get over what we've forgotten, how yeah. does... How is... How, he seems to be about, like, working working with the traces, working with... See, you're getting it, but you don't, you're not believing it. Your explanation is very clear to me. He said, he said, you know, because... What other people can get over, they really want to get at any cost the memory back. Mm -hmm. They want to connect to Africa. Mm -hmm. They do through Afrocentricity, all these black identity things. Mm -hmm. But he's saying what remains of Africa is only the traces. It doesn't matter if you forgot, but it's your attempt, you use the word. How you work on it is your working that way. Well, if you want me to, to contradict myself, I contradict myself. The way you work on it, that's what your authenticity is. That's what's important. Mm -hmm. Finding the memory itself is not important. But the, the time. So incorporating the traces into something new. Yeah, that's, that's what's, what's important. Saying. Yeah. So your explanation to me is perfect. Okay. But it seems like a contradiction to you. No, now I get it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's your, the situation in which you put yourself thinking about it, you sort about it, you create a poem about it, you write about it. It's that moment. I mean, one of you said this yesterday, that authenticity is this thing that cannot repeat itself. Yes. Okay. So it's that kind of authenticity. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, I don't think he's, because he's responding to, his predecessors, but also black Americans, because black Americans have a different approach to Africa. They are more identitarian. They are more, I don't want to use this, separatist. They, they have an exclusivist relation to Africa. Whereas Lisa is saying, you don't need that. You just have the traces. You know, when you left Africa, you, you were put on the boat, Several Africans, you don't speak the same languages, you don't, you don't have the same tradition, you don't have the same religions, they took your clothes off, uh, they you have no suitcase. You know, when I was coming to America, I had a suitcase, I had a passport. You see, you have all these things, and that's why if you look at immigrants, 
they always go to the suitcase and look what is inside it, if the photographs are there. Slaves didn't have that luxury. Slaves were just put in there. So Bisa said, by putting them together like that, they were forced to relate to each other, to come up with a new language. You know, this, is, this is what he's saying here. So when you go through the Atlantic crossing, you are becoming a new person. And this new person is a multiple person. He's not just African, he's not just European, he's not just uh, a creolized person, but he's all of us. He has several identities. And that's very important to him. I think that's what he's saying uh, in, in that particular situation. But I think the, your point about forgetting is very important because many people are completely uh, anxiety ridden when they cannot really trace their roots. And he says, come on. You know, don't make that. It doesn't matter if you forget, but if you work, it's the work that's, that matters. I mean, Senghor also said that you liberate yourself through work, you know, uh, through the rhythm and so on. So, so that's what he's trying to say there. Uh, perhaps that's the best way. Let's go through these kind of reactions. Uh, the other question I had uh, was, and I, I think I understood it, but maybe you can give me more clarity. When he was talking about, for example, that relating to things via DNA caused almost more problems yeah. than it did good. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's, it's a detected way of finding you. And then he used the example of the Hutus and the, and the Tutsis. Yeah, the Hutus you know? and the Tutsis. And that it was our... That we create. Oh, I guess what he was saying is we created through our science. We created segregation where there was not. Yeah, through our insistence of having these genealogical branches, having families, mm -hmm. and then excluding other people from our families, then we end up creating a situation like the Hutus and the Tutsis. This is what he said. You know. Uh, Genealogy, he said genealogy itself is dangerous. He preferred a relation of people around the world who don't know each other to uh, the relation coming to kinship. Uh, because the Hutus and Tutsis are, if you don't know this stuff, I think everybody knows the story, but they, uh, they were always there, so they were not invented. Many, some people now, they say that they were invented as tribes. They say, you guys are Hutus, you guys are Tutsis. But it, uh, it's at least possible to explain that when uh, uh, the Belgian arrived in uh, Rwanda, you know, that right behind the Congo, you know, those, these were the, the Belgian colonies. Uh, and this is where Heart of Darkness was written by Joseph Conrad. So when they arrived there, they usually oppose tribes to each other. And the particular opposition of the Hutus and the Tutsis were that you guys are taller, you know, you have refined faces, you are different from these other guys who are shorter and so on. So there's one opposition of family to family. Tall people, short people. Uh, you guys are farmers, sedentary, civilized people. These people are always after cows. The nomads, they have no identity. So they, they oppose them like that. So when independence came, they themselves saw themselves like that. And they finally start fighting. And of course, you know the rest, the genocide. Right. So Glisa is using that as an example of the negative consequences of I get it. genealogical truth. When you used to have the person who was the, what's it called again, the narrator, the storyteller? Griot. The yeah. That that never caused division or war between uh, no the it, or, no or the, the different context the, the griot the best way to see the griot is to see like the blind storyteller in uh, in the art is a Homer. you know the griot was just telling the stories of empires that's his main role like the the story of the Sunyata epic the story of the window epic. So griots are no, no more dangerous than novels. 
you know, the storytellers, that's the primary role. Right, but if there was like a division or like a breakoff or a fight... Then they participated in that, you right. Then it was still a... Yeah. Keeping that a, a lifestyle. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it's just that that was more of a, um, I guess a less in, a colonialized imposed right. way of warfare. I, I think if you follow her logic, in some ways it's not far from these sons. That the grill too will reinforce identity. This is basically the logic that the species is positive. So if you are opposed to any kind of fixed identity, then yeah, you will be against the leaders also. Because they are praising people, telling them how much of, let's say, a Jawara they are. And then if you feel pride, pride in that, you could oppose yourself to somebody who is not you. Yeah. So that's, yes, you absolutely... But you, your position will be closer to Gleason's position in the sense that he is opposed to any kind of closed identity, any kind of fixed identity, any kind of unitary identity. He's fixed, he's completely opposed to those. He, he's not, he, I mean, even, he's not even as provisional as the guy to speak about who talks about uh, strategic essentialism. He's not even there. He, he wants open identities. Whereas storytellers, novelists, uh, historians, they are into defining identities. They are into defining geographies. They are into defining spaces. And they usually close them. They don't leave them open. They will say, these are barbarians. These are the, the girls. These are the Celtic people. The, these are the Indians. You know? So in that sense, Gleason will let you uh, okay. In my tribalist sense, the griot is a good guy. You see, I would say, oh yeah, this guy tells my story. So you know, if I'm if I'm a tribalist, I want to be proud. I say, yeah, he tells my story. He's a good guy. But this I would say, but be careful. You know, your story is a story opposed to the other people's story. Yeah. Uh, let, let me just let you yeah. to the areas that you thought. Interpolated you, like the areas that you like. I like the old people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. So what I really felt there was a bit of a problem with that, though, which is that I guess I kind of felt like, um, yeah, it's kind of like his example for opaqueness kind of took him into a preference. Um, and then, so, but then there's a weird space of, um, you know, if if I have a preference for a person, or if I you know if I just generally like one person and I generally don't like another person, is that okay then? Because that's like that's that's no opaqueness for myself in the sense of I like some people and I don't like other people. It's you know, and that's something that can, can function. And yet that yeah. then all of a sudden comes back into another problematic argument about right. See, I, think, I would yeah. say it's for the reasons you don't necessarily know the reason why you don't like them. Right. And that's, I think, the passage he's talking about. As opposed to not liking it because I don't know what it is. Right. See, if you don't like somebody, like you don't like broccoli, well, first of all, some people say, well, not liking broccoli is hardly like not liking somebody. <laughs> right. But, but the, the point yeah, yeah. is, if you don't like somebody, it, see, if you are a rationalist, a philosopher, you don't like decent because if you want a law to legislate that, you know, we all like each other, that we all live together. Uh, so you could point, you could argue that this could be opening the door for people not liking people, which is a position that's confusing you. But uh, I think, you know, uh, you're right in saying that it's like not liking broccoli, actually. But he's not making a judgment on it. He's saying some of these things he can't control. It's but just he is. You know, haven't you ever not liked something as a child and then you grow into like it as you get older? There is that too. Yeah. That's the closing. That's what, what like. yeah, okay. So, yeah, get used to, used to it. it. <laughs> He's saying you don't need to know something or understand something to respect it as being equal but different to you in a way. I think he's calling, calling intuition and the knowledge yeah. to sustain that. 
Yeah. And yeah. really just that, you know, it's, it's calling right. to this very crucial moment of your intuition. Right. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Uh, it, and also, Glissa is using that word, opacity, to help you to understand his theory of relation. He said, don't try to understand everything. Create intuition, create a relation with things instead. So, you know, because when you try to understand something, you are already imposing yourself on that thing. So, I see the logics that, you know, the critiques that you're making of it, you know, because once, you know, it's threatening to say, well, I don't have to like you. Because, uh, first of all, most of us keep that to ourselves. We don't, you know, so we don't, you can be honest like the poet. But this is not, and then the rationalists would say, well, you know, if we let this happen, the world will become a chaotic. So rationalists would be concerned about that. But this I said, no, uh, create a relation with it. If you create a relation, maybe what uh, Courtney said, maybe you get to like it. Maybe what he's saying, your intuitions will begin to re-represent that. I don't know. Uh, but Opacity should be something that we have as a point of departure. Let's not come to people with transparency. Say, I know you. You look like this. I know you. This is what's going to happen. You know, that's what transparency does. You know, uh, I'm a black man. You know, you are a white man, and so on and so on. He said, let's not do that. Let's uh, let's give opas. Let's give the people the right to be okay. Once we give them the right to be opaque, yeah. No, you go ahead. What I found from the film that, well, from, yeah, that I found a little bit kind of naive to some degree was that he, after the 30 years, the two, three decades, that he came back to Mexico to tell this again. But that is a poet. He yes. has this thing. Yeah, well, okay, this is what, maybe this is where I wanted to go because he ends up telling that, they, that you should go out with go up with that to the UN. The UN, just poetry there. I you don't mean, like the UN. I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen that the UN is... Uh, yeah. I, I, like, I like declarations, I read declarations, like the Outer Space Declaration, like the Geostationary Orbit Declaration, like the Human Rights Declaration, and I like this from Bandung, the Non-Aligned Declaration, so what, but how effective are they? I know, it's like, that's the question. Um, so, I think I got the point with poetry. Right. To right. them, but right. Right. Exactly. What, what, what do you think? I, I like to know what you think because you reacted like. Well, I just found your UN comment amusing, and I sort of agree with you on that one. Like, it, it's great writing, and it's cleverly done, but <laughs> it's just it's as far as it goes. Okay. My issue with the opacity is that it it provides a means for honest connection that the foe the forced transparency that we have, this fake relationship between others, this need to be open whether we are or not, right. prevents a genuine relationship. So let's say that I genuinely dislike you. Uh, that doesn't change the way I need to behave. Right. But trying to lie to myself about it, and fine, say it's a race thing. Right. Okay? Right. Even if it is a race thing, if I am unable to acknowledge that in myself, and just go, I don't get it, I don't know why, but I'm aware of this preference. If you have to hide from that or deny it, you'll never get to a point of honest communication. Honestly overcoming or acknowledging hatred is a much more effective means of eventually resolving conflict than stifling it and denying it. Transparency is a common term for capitalism and businesses. Right. And opacity is, is not. No, that, that's absolutely true. Yes. I think you both. Excellent ways, yeah. yeah. Say more about opacity, it's interesting. I, I have to go defend opacity in a document as I get some ideas from you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the, the, the way he, one of my big issues, like I, I taught in city school and everyone loves diversity, it's a huge buzzword, but that's all I ever saw it as. No one could really justify the value of diversity, especially while you simultaneously support the quality. So when he made his comment about borders, it was such a beautiful articulation of yeah. all the things I've been trying to express as a solution. 
But the reality is that we don't, and this goes back to my opacity thing, we don't deny that we are distinct. We don't try to force others to be like us. We don't remove the borders, but we make them permeable. Yeah. We make it a matter of communication yeah. and relations yeah. so that yeah. it stops being me as a person that can't get through or me as a person that defines the borders. But we allow the culture and the mutual identity to create different places so we can all grow and relate. Yeah. And you need that opacity, you need that center of honesty to do that. Like that becomes the part of you that moves. No, no, you, you're right. I mean, it, this sounds, some people are surprised, he's not against frontiers. He says, you know, I love to travel from Italy to France, and suddenly they see a new flavor. From France to Germany, they see a new... So we need those frontiers, but they need to be permanent. This is what he's saying. He's not, he's against frontiers, you know, well, his definition in the film is that frontiers enable you to pass from one flavor another flavor. The word used in French is saveur, which is much better, you know. Uh, no. Savoir? No, saveur. Saveur. Saveur, yes. saveur is, is the perfume, oh. the perfume of food, you know, the taste of food, you know, so it's the going from one cultural zone to another cultural zone. That's sometimes, you know, you go from Brazil to Colombia, you know, they, they say people say the, the, that border crossing is lots of fun to them. But he doesn't believe in the borders that create walls and people can pass and it become violent. This, this is what he said. And I think you're right. When he relates that to opacity, but even more interesting, he goes way beyond Fanon and Senghor when and then also from the US notions of multiculturalism. Because the reason why I like uh these is finally I have found somebody who's not only criticizing the West, but he's criticizing the non-Western world also. Because he realized that they all are, you know, they all are positioned on grounds that they don't want to budge from. They, they, don't, they don't want to give up anything. You know, Africans are authentically Africans, Israelis are authentically Israelis, French are authentically French. So Lisa is, are, you know, this is uh, criticism applied to all these groups. But, and he said, actually, it's not that difficult. He says, by relating to the other person, you don't lose yourself. You know, this is why he said, I can change by exchanging with you without losing myself or denaturating, you know, destroying myself. Je peux changer, and me changer avec l'autre, sans me détruire, ni me dénaturer. This, this is quite important because most of the time, many of us are afraid to get too close to the other. We, we are afraid of being contaminated. Well, if, you know, the young black people are afraid of losing their authenticity. You know, don't be a white boy. That's the way the young black people would say. Or, you know, in the richer places also, they don't want to get too close to the poorer people. So, Glissan said, you can learn from the person without losing yourself. On the contrary, you are enriching yourself. And that really, to me, is a step beyond uh, the British cultural studies. It's a step beyond what I have been uh, raised in, in black studies in the United States. But it's also a step beyond what the great white man is telling us every day. So you see, so he's not criticizing just one area. He's, he's saying every time you close yourself, you actually are uh, impeding relation. And this relation actually takes place in the, its best form through opacity. That, I really think that that's a giant step in terms of what we are uh, dealing with today with diversity, multiculturalism. He, he seriously thought about that. Well, and bringing up closeness and openness in relationship to opacity and um, transparency, we kind of immediately think on a model that transparency is open and opacity is closed. Right. 
at the same time, when you become transparent, completely visible, you come to a closeness, like a resting spot of what is visible and what right. can yeah, be yeah. visible and what you think should be visible and how people should see or what's there. Mm. And I would, I would say that this is perhaps more of a transparency can, is more closed off than opacity where things are still kind of up in the air. This is why I was compared to neoliberalism earlier. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you're right about that. Transparency is only an illusion. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit like democracy. You know, democracy is the best form we have, but democracy has trapped us. We don't have a nice, a more revolutionary discourse beyond democracy. You know, but yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, other approaches to Mr. Gleason. I'm curious as to what you think about him talking about small countries. Oh, I know, I know, that's just, uh, I know, it's, it's completely true. You know, because Gisa is talking about, to, you know, it does contradict me completely, but that is what Gisa is talking about. He believes that small countries or the archipelagos uh, can experience uh, faster what he called what in his theory of la pensée de tremblement, the tremulous thinking or the quickful thinking, you know, because they can understand uh, the language of of nature, you know, they can understand the language of these mountains. So when some, some change is happening, they feel it before the centers, and the centers in this case, you know, Paris, London, New York, and so on. So he's reversing things, you know. We all think that the trends are being set uh, in the big centers, whether the trends are artistic trends or they are uh, economic trends, political trends. But he said the small places feel it first, and when they feel it first, they have more resources, uh, and what do you mean by resources? They have more poetic resources, they have more intuitions, they have more, you know, this is no longer symbol, but they have more emotion to relate to this and to resolve it. Uh, because in the cities, in the big centers, we have lost, we have lost this relation to nature. We have lost it. So, what do I think about that? I actually like that. But what do I think about that in my theory that the nation needs to have a more a, a bargaining, uh, uh, a, a leverage to, 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 to discuss with the rest of the world? You see, because I'm still, I'm, I'm struggling my way out of Fanon, but my thinking is still Fanonian. I'm still thinking that, look, here is what's happening. You Africans will never get out of this mess until you have a bargaining position. But ultimately, the logic of this, Gisa would say, I'm thinking toward the end of the world. Because if Africa positions itself powerfully, Latin America positions itself powerfully, where are we going to get resources? There will be war. The reason why you have smaller wars now and Victims are being killed, sacrificed, collateral damage is because Latin America, Asia, and Africa are not organized. When they organize themselves, they'll be bigger wars because everybody will need the resources that they can no longer get. So, Lisa will say, you know, is, that's not necessary. Fanon will say, that's necessary. So, my thinking is rational still. Glissant is looking for a poetic way of thinking about these things. So I realize that, but I, I'm not at the point of accepting it. This is why I'm so attracted to Glissant, because it's completely uh, telling me that I don't need to imitate the West. I don't need to have bigger powers in Africa in order to, to, to respond to the bigger power in Europe. That's what Glissant is saying. So, you know, it, it, I have to get myself to that position because it, it, it looked like I'm responding to the sheer marshals instead of 
saying, let's discuss this in Byzantian terms. You see what I mean? Uh, so that's the, so it's, it's an important point in that sense. Since we're yeah. still in economy, economy um, what do you know? What is there any, any position from Lisan uh, regarding Cuba and Castro, especially? Like any, any, Cuba, Cuba, yes, he has. He feels toward the Cuban people, but Castro to him will be like Fano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely like Fano. Castro as a person. But anyway, I was looking at more from the side of the violence. Of Embargo. I mean, oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. This is what I mean for uh, the Cuban people because he, he listened like many people, I think, uh, in places like this, uh, definitely think that the embargo on, on Cuba is, uh, is a violence, you know, neoliberal violence, but also violence of a small group of people in Miami who have a lobbying power in Washington, D.C. And, you know, you have to be, I was in Cuba last December, you know, you have to be, visit Cuba to see, uh, you know, people on the one, I think everything people tell you is true. That is, they have more doctors, they have more, you know, uh, developed people are developed as opposed to other terrible countries. But there is hunger in Cuba today. People are really you know, suffering at the same time. And that's because of the U.S. embargo. All that has to happen is for the U.S. to open the door for Cuba. All of Latin America, because Cubans have doctors that they can export. They have health. So it, it will just subvert the, the, the health care system in America in a minute. And many people do not want to see that. They do not want to see a small country like Cuba influence not only Venezuela, Brazil, Latin America, and U.S. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. There are many ties. There are many lines spreading from there. But one that kind of relates to what we just saw is that um, when he talks about the Creole Garden, mm -hmm. and he says that it's something that disappeared, well, that is kind of a knowledge that is not there anymore. Um, well, you're right because Cuba has a lot of organic farming. It's got yeah. a lot of estuaries. Yeah. It's got a, a lot of things of the environment uh -huh. kind of forced upon. And also Latin America, you, you see this with the indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. It's still alive, and we're trying to to get back to that. Of course, not with, not with that not with that despair that we need to get back to the past. No, no. Mm -hmm. Know that, mm -hmm. for example, just put it to continue with the economical problem with the Monsanto uh, maize. Yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, that's completely ruined. Uh, our no, no, I didn't put that in the film, but there is that. He talks about Monsanto oh. and Chiquita Banana oh. and all these things. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is true. I mean, the idea of cre again, he and my I edited the film, so I wanted to leave the Creole garden to a poetic level where you can apply. It. And if the two of you are saying that this actually literally exists today as part of organizing communities. Yeah, so I understand that. But the thing is trying to posit it as poetry. You know, where you, know, you have a lot of trees and they feed each other, they become organic, uh, uh, and these are reasons, as opposed to one tree that kills the other trees around it, and so yeah, no. no so, by the way, it's really nice that the tree you have there for yeah that was, that that's in front of his house and uh, we kept making the film and I said that he had not talked about the tree because I I, I trapped him like this I said you know in black American literature especially feminist literature black feminist literature Alice Walker Zora Neale Tony K. Bambara when you read them there is always a tree and the tree is always blocking the door and the tree is the symbol of man. The black man just closing the door and the black woman came past. You can see this, you know, from the eyes we're watching that to the present, you know, in literature. And he said, no, the tree is completely different from, for me. The tree is the genealogical tree and that's our biggest problem. So he went on this very poetic explanation. I mean, my intention was to really have him be as simple as possible. And because when you read the book here, 
it's, it's absolutely complex. You know, any of his books, you know, because it's poetry. Yeah. Do I have to say something? No. Okay. Overall reactions to 